This morning, I welcome you to join me in Psalm 13. We're looking at the next facet of the life of David, especially as we're going through the Christ Our Refuge series. As we look into David's life in Psalm 13, he's writing his testimony of what went on when everything began to fall apart in his life. Up until this point, everything had been going so well. He was the giant killer as Goliath fell before his slingshot there in the Valley of Elah. He'd been invited to be the worship leader for the king himself. That extended into him being the head of the commandos, the warrior for King Saul, leading out a band of raiders that was never defeated. From that came the king's cabinet, the king's son-in-law, and then as we've seen in the last few weeks, everything began to fall apart. David found his family was wrenched and taken into pieces as he had to send his parents to Moab, as his wife stayed home with her father, and as he was on the run. David found that he lost his job, he lost his standing, he lost his home. And then as he fled to Gath and was with the Philistines, he even lost all sense of his own personal safety and and was in total desperation. As we come to Psalm 13, we come to David's heart cry as he feels abandoned. Sometimes, in the lives of some believers, there comes a point so low, a time so dark, a place so deep, that we actually feel that everyone, even God, has abandoned us. That's where we find David in Psalm 13 this morning. This is actually the center of our look at Christ, our refuge. We're looking successively at Christ, our refuge, the refuge for the unclean, the refuge for those who feel weary, and now the refuge for those who are lonely. David is certainly lonely. He is certainly in the dark waters, hitting the bottom, and facing the incredible convulsions of his life. What's so wonderful for us is that sometimes when we hit the bottom, sometimes when we go through dark waters or face incredible convulsions in our lives, that's when we notice that Christ has been there all the time. I learned this lesson very deeply at 27,000 feet. I'll never forget two years ago coming home from the Shepherds Conference in Los Angeles. As I was flying home on the Southwest flight, I thought it was perfect. The seat next to me was empty and soon it became my office. And I spread out all of my materials around me, and having heard the safety lecture on the pre-flight prep time at least a dozen or more times, I just started reading and ignored it all. I never thought about anything other than what did I need to get done before landing. On that particular flight, there were no events. That empty seat and the world slowly drifting by outside my window just made for a perfect work time. After a bit, Clouds began to darken the skies, so I had to turn on the light to see, but I didn't even notice that. I just kept studying. Then there was that little reminder, time to fasten the seatbelts, but that's ordinary and uncommon. But all of a sudden, I started listening. When the plane did the first roller coaster move, all of us paid attention. Soon we were dropping just like a lead weight and then going straight up like on an elevator or on some kind of a ride at a fair. And then a real hard jolt knocked open a few of those overhead compartments and things actually began to tumble out and hit the floor. And all over the plane, you could hear those scattered cries of fear. From that moment on, the only thing I could think about was who exactly is up front flying this airplane. I wonder how much experience they have. How skilled are they in thunderstorm management? And the tremendous lesson I learned that day about flying, do you know what it was? It's the lesson we don't pay much attention to life if it's all going smoothly. Who even thinks about the pilot until the weather gets rough, until the world around us jolts and jumps and rocks and swerves? Then all of a sudden, that's all we think about. Who is steering this careening machine? Suddenly we realize how important the pilot really is. And we realize our life is truly in their hands. The same is true for life on planet Earth. The fewer the bumps, the more we ignore our pilot. The smoother the ride of our life, the more we forget about the one 
in whose hands is our very life's breath. But just let the rough family times come, or the roller coaster ride of our emotions, or the crash of our finances, or the sudden plummet of our health. Then we think about our pilot. Well, as we continue in our Christ Our Refuge series, we're looking at loneliness. We're tracking David's life recorded in the scriptures and matching up the psalms he wrote from each event. This allows us to see all the ways that he experienced loneliness and then to see all the ways our Lord rescued him from his troubles. This morning is David's deepest trial. We are past the terrible situation in Gath that we saw last time in Psalm 34. And we're entering into what Psalm 57 begins, which will be in a couple of weeks, which is David's cave experience when he's living in a cave. But right now, we're going through the time he felt abandoned by God. And in that dark hour, David finds hope. Why would he find hope? How did David find hope? Well, as we keep seeing in God's word, troubles, trials, tests, and temptations, each one of them pushed David toward the Lord. God was always his choice. Seeking God was his habit. God was his desire because David supremely loved the Lord with all of his heart. These dark times just surfaced the reality that down deep in his soul, David had entrusted his life to the Lord. That's exactly the way life was for David. The more he got shaken, the more he thought about and entrusted his life to the Lord. And the psalm that is open before us this morning, Psalm 13, is David's confession to all the world about who was flying his plane through the turbulent and stormy skies of life. Even when he felt abandoned, he found that God was still there, flying him all the way through life. Well, Psalm 13, verse 1. Let me read you his cry, this anguish cry. And what I see here, because as a follower of Christ for over 40 years, I'm convinced this feeling of abandonment is very common even among believers. Verse 1, David says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel of my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? What David is evidencing in these four statements is some of the common causes for cave times, feelings of being abandoned by others, of being all alone, and even God has turned his back. Here are just a few doorways for you to think about as I began this trek through the 13th Psalm. Here are some ways in our lives that are doorways that we stand in David's shoes over and over again through life, a doorway that can lead us to feeling abandoned. Sometimes we feel abandoned through a protracted illness. Sometimes we just don't seem to, to get well. It, the illness never ends. Our strength never returns and our future plans begin to fade. And with that, our hopes begin to fade. And then we start feeling like God has let us down. He's abandoned us. He's not helping us get well. Another doorway to a cave is a sudden loss of income or job or both. Then a financial need that becomes tangled and the needs grow and, and all of a sudden going on is seemingly hopeless. Other doorways to these cave times can be through our marriages and families. Wayward children cause immeasurable pain to believing parents. So does an alcoholic spouse or an unsafe family member. Maybe it's work. Sometimes work opens to us a dark time. Maybe a demanding and unreasonable boss that just never can be pleased, that you can never work hard enough for, long enough for, well enough for. Or maybe you have a grueling and unending schedule at work of repetitive, monotonous work. Or maybe it's just a, a jealous and spiteful co-worker who is injurious, who, who wants to get even or is so jealous that, that they try and impede you. Usually these times make us feel that no one really cares about us. And then we start feeling that people are abandoning us and they're not standing with us. They're not friendly like they were. And then it, that starts the, the spiral downward. And we think God 
he's abandoned us too. And that's exactly the pattern. If you look closely at the biography of David that Psalm 13 reflects, David has come to the point that he feels abandoned. He's so abandoned, he cries out as if he's not going to even be able to survive. Now, as I studied this week and and read every commentary that I have on the Psalms, and especially the life of David and the time surrounding the 13th Psalm, I found amazingly there's little said or even written in any Christian literature about how to help a believer who feels abandoned by God. Even the classic work by the great Bible expositor D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. This monumental book, which is titled The Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Cures for Believers. Even that complete resource doesn't cover, even once, the topic of feeling abandoned. Why do you suppose that this wouldn't be in any literature? Well, I think personally it's because we've been taught that Christians aren't supposed to experience that kind of a feeling. That we're to have a life more abundant and we're supposed to live victoriously. In fact, when the dying French atheist Voltaire said, I'm abandoned by God and man, we're not surprised. Oh, I believe should feel that way. But if any of us would admit to such a feeling, why many of our friends would look askance at us. In fact, if you said that in church this morning and told someone you felt abandoned by God, your friends might shake their head and wonder if you're even a Christian. Now think about it. Isn't that true? Isn't that why sometimes we don't really share our deepest problems and needs in this and many other ways in our Christian lives? That's why we don't talk to other Christians about what's really going on. Well, thankfully, for all of us who have ever struggled, David talks. Aren't we glad that a spiritual giant like David doesn't cover up his struggles? Aren't you glad that David didn't hide his feelings just because they were bad? He doesn't mind being thought of as being weak, a failure, or troubled. He said, I don't care. I'm just going to cry out to the Lord. Now as you listen to his cries, as you look down at Psalm 13, you're listening to the cries of David the psalmist. He wrote half of the book of Psalms, 73 of the 150, we're sure he wrote. This is David the spiritual giant the only one who believed God when the whole nation didn't believe him and defeated the the chief prime nemesis of Israel, Goliath. This is David, the king God hand-picked. This is David, the man that God says is after his own heart. And that David is unashamed to bear his dark struggles. He's unashamed to open up his soul for all to see. Let's watch him in Psalm 13 as he bears his soul at the deepest and the darkest hour of his loneliness when even God is far away. I'm going to be reading the 13th Psalm. Listen to David's cry of abandonment and then join me as I pray that God will teach these truths to our heart. Verse 1, Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long... Will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemies be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, I thank you that David opened his heart. I thank you that he was unashamed to cry to you. As we look at your word, as we some times see ourselves reflected there may we likewise be unashamed to cry to you unafraid to reach out the hand of faith and say Lord how long how long will my sickness go how long will I go without job and income how long do I have to put up with this unreasonable situation at work 
in my marriage, in my family? How long do I have to feel the pain of this situation? May we, when we feel abandoned, like David, find that you're right there all the time. We'll thank you as you write your word on the pages of our lives, as you speak to our hearts in our darkest times. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Turn back with me to 1 Samuel 21. I I want you to remember there, and you you might even look in your notes in your Bible, in 1 Samuel 21 and 22, that's our bearings, the sequence of events. Do you remember uh, Saul hurls in in chapter 21, he hurls the spear. Remember when you marked that uh, in verse 9? He hurls the spear at David. That's David's notice that he's off work. And immediately David flees and he goes to see the priests in Nob, and while he's there, he gets Goliath's sword, he takes off to Gath, he gets to Gath, and he's scared to death because he goes into Goliath's hometown, they take the sword, they imprison him, and the Lord allows him to escape with his life. But he's hit the bottom emotionally. But in Psalm 34, we find he's still, and from 1 Samuel 21, he's still crying out to the Lord, and he's still believing the Lord's looking at him and hearing him, and, and you know what's amazing? Somewhere between that last verse, look at 1 Samuel 21, that last verse, now look at chapter 22, verse 1. Somewhere between that little juncture of time, David feels abandoned. And right there, if you're marking in your Bible, mark Psalm 13. Because Psalm 13 is what is going on in David's life between Gath and before he gets to the cave of Adullam which is chapter 22, verse 1. Now this, remember, is a time when David wrote more psalms than at any other time in his life. We know that when he gets to the cave of Adullam, he's joined by 400 men whose hearts are drawn to him. So he's going to have companionship. In fact, before long, we're going to see that David is, is alone even in a crowd of 400 people. But right now, he's alone with no one. And he's fleeing for his life. And this is when more of his heart is shown. In fact, if you're taking notes, the cave times, uh, the Psalms written in this time of being totally alone in the cave are Psalms 4, Psalm 13, Psalm 40, Psalm 57, that's when everyone joins him. Psalm 70, that's when he looks back. And Psalm 141 and 142, all of those Psalms are the the biggest block of David's writing. And they come from his darkest hours. That's why this is such a precious time. David is abandoned and dejected in Psalm 13. In the two uh, verses at the beginning, he shares the depths of his soul in those four cries of anguish that I've read to you twice this morning. But look back with them now. Turn over to the 13th Psalm, and I want you to see this. From 1 Samuel 21 and 22, go to Psalm 13. And I want to show you that each of these cries that David is expressing reflects something from his background. Hebrew literature has some interesting figures of speech. The first one is called erotasis. It's asking a question without waiting or even expecting an answer. Now, in in the Psalms, when people that have spent their lives studying the poetic literature of, of the book of Psalms in the book of, uh, I mean, in the Hebrew language, they have classified these different ways that David wrote this poetry and the other psalmists. And, and what they say is that this is usually a sign of deep emotional struggle when you just fire off the questions and don't even wait for an, an answer or don't even expect one. These four cries also represent something interesting. Notice that all four of them have the same words repeated at the beginning of these successive sentences. Four times, how long, how long, how long, how long. Each sentence starts with that, and that's another figure of speech that's called anaphora. So, erotasis, you don't even wait for an answer. Anaphora, you say the same thing, almost like you're stuttering. Well, as we listen, David cries in anguish four times. And he is expressing to us, he's so overcome with sorrow and grief and feeling so alone and abandoned, he isn't even waiting for an answer. Now, what is he talking about? Start out with the first one. How long, O Lord, will you forget me? Now look at the next word. Forever. First point, if you're taking notes, 
David is saying, my life feels like an endless struggle. An endless struggle. David is abandoned. He's dejected. Everyone has left him. He is hunted by his own family. That's his father-in-law. His own people, like Doeg the Edomite and Saul's army. His own fellow people of God. See, he just left the pagan Philistines that worship false gods. Now, you would expect them to, to be harmful and injurious in pursuing him. He's home. He's with the covenant people. He's with the fellow people of God. And he's threatened And now he's alone in a bleak desert region. David feels with every fiber of his humanity dejected and abandoned. One commentator of a generation ago said, Well, might David have understood what this was. When hunted by Saul, he knew not where to betake himself. At one time seeking refuge among the Moabites, at another time in the wilderness of Ziph, And now ever an outlaw hiding himself from the hands of Saul. Well, by repeating himself four times, he's saying, Don't miss how deep my feeling runs. I just can't go on. So if you've ever been to the point where in your marriage, in your family, at work, in school, maybe in the privacy of your own will, you just say, I can't go on then remember one thing. David is feeling those feelings at this moment with you. And he's writing what the Lord demonstrated his faithfulness to him in the darkest, deepest time when he said, life is a constant struggle. Number one, I can't go on. Number two, look at the ending of verse one. His second statement, how long will you hide your face from me? What he's saying is, my life seems to have lost God's blessing. His first statement was, my life's an endless struggle. But you notice they're getting worse. He says, not just is my life an endless struggle, but I seem to have had God's blessing. He was talking about that in the 34th Psalm. He's saying, God, even though I'm with my enemies and even though I'm desperate, you're still blessing me. When he gets to Psalm 13, he says, what's happened? I've even lost God's blessing. And what David saw was a lack of apparent blessings from God. Uh, Remember, sometimes we don't know God's there, but he's there. Sometimes we don't think he's blessing, but he is. We don't think he's watching over us, he is. That's where David has gotten. It's a lack of the apparent blessing. But remember, reality and perception both deeply influence our lives. If you perceive someone doesn't like you, it doesn't matter whether they do or not. It changes you if you base your response on your perception and David does that and so every part of his life he says it's troubled it seems to suffer from a lack of your blessings think about what that would feel like in our lives okay just sometimes we detach ourselves from the Bible we think ah yeah 3,000 years ago David uh uh-huh giants Philistines yep that'll never happen to me well has this ever happened to you because this is 21st century applications of what the anguish David was going through, how it would look in our lives. Number one, sometimes we say, well, my family doesn't seem blessed anymore. And we think about the early joys of newly wedded life, and they began to fade when all of a sudden the reality of personal differences began to stress that relationship. And, and we say, well, has God ceased to bless our marriage? Because we don't feel like we felt in those early days of newly wedded bliss? Or or what about when your family comes? My family, the children, those quiet, smiling children that that just coo and Google or or gurgle at us and, and just enjoy everything we do. What about when they grow into selfish and rebellious youths and the joy of our home life is replaced with tension, with confrontation? It seems like all we do is correct And there's that sorrow in our hearts. Then we say, has God ceased to bless our family? Or or another way. Uh, David, remember, we saw last time he lost his job. What about when we say, well, my work. My work doesn't seem blessed by God anymore. Uh, When I started out, I used to be idealistic and creative. I had boundless energy. I was just leading the growth of, of my company, and I was succeeding in my career. And then... That's replaced with constant obstacles. 
and personal stagnation. Uh, we don't have new ideas for how to sell or market or do our work. And some days we sit back and we think, has God ceased to bless my work? Or how about your ministry? Sometimes we say, my ministry doesn't seem blessed anymore. Uh, I don't have a spring in my step. My feet feel like lead when I get out of my car and cross the parking lot to serve in Awana or to go into the youth ministry. I, I used to just be humming and singing and making melody on the way to the choir or orchestra. And my song is gone. It's become a, a real burden to teach Sunday school. And I don't want to join in the flock discussion. My joy and sense of purpose are gone. And we start asking ourselves, has God ceased to bless my ministry? Or what about my spiritual life? You say, that that isn't blessed anymore. Uh, The word is stale to me. It just is lifeless. It's just paper and ink. And my singing at church is lifeless. Coming to worship, it's drudgery. I'd rather be anywhere but here. And all of a sudden, my sins begin to feel unforgiven. And my past starts coming back to haunt me. And then I I stand before God and I feel stained. And I sing to God and I feel distant. And I sit in my chair, in my pew, in my place, and I feel like no one, even God, cares about my soul. And I start to think, has God ceased to bless me? What is David saying? Well, when when he felt that life was an endless struggle, he said, I can't go on. And when he feels like he's lost God's blessing, he's saying, God, I don't see you anymore. In my home, at my work, in my life, I I just can't see you anymore. Look at verse 2 of the 13th Psalm real quickly with me. He says this, How long shall I take counsel in my soul? Now here's the key. Having sorrow in my heart daily. What he said is, my mind seems troubled. David says, I have dark thoughts and uncontrolled emotions. In fact, when Kyle and Dalich, the great German Hebrew experts, went through this, they said the, the construction of David's words were a reflection of having dark feelings. His emotions were dark. And he says, I just feel like, like everything's just out of control. My emotions are uncontrolled. My thoughts are darkened. You know, he loved the Lord, but listen, all the stress of the terrible plight he was in from Saul, from the Philistines, and now as he's on the run to a cave, that terrible plight drained him of all peace and all joy. He had a spiritual flat tire. And what he said is, my mind seems troubled. What David's going through is a common experience. David was swept away by his emotions, and and those emotions caused him to not be able to calmly reflect on the faithful hand of God in the past. And when he couldn't reflect on God's faithfulness in the past, he couldn't feel the comfort of trusting his future to the Lord. David ruminated and meditated so long on disaster after disaster, he began to just feed this and fuel the fire of this darkness of his soul. And and he couldn't stop. It was almost like uh, it was snowballing and going down faster and faster. Emotionally, he was just going downhill. And that led to feed these dark thoughts of hopelessness. Now, there are many, many causes for, for these feelings that David confesses. We can see them in the lives of people in Scripture. So I want you to think about that because, again... You don't have to be running from the Philistines, and you don't have to have a personal adversary that's trying to kill you physically to go through these kind of of emotions. And there are many causes for them. One is emotional temperament. David was probably of the temperament that was more prone to discouragement. I mean, if you've read the Psalms, David is up, down, up, down. And did you know that's a personality type? That's someone that, that is prone to having these feelings, these these unbelievable temperament feelings that are prone to discouragement. Now here, again, let me quote from Martin Lloyd-Jones again. The opening pages of his monumental book that I previously cited about the causes and cures for, for spiritual depression, he said this, Foremost among all causes for spiritual depression is temperament. See, there isn't a good temperament and a bad temperament. If you are one of these flatline people, you think the up and down people are, are you know, just... 
uh, uncontrollable. And if you're an up and down person, you think that the flat line people don't care about anything. And they're just, they just have no feelings. And see, God designed us. We're little spiritual snowflakes. We're all very differently wired. And there are temperaments that are prone to discouragement. And that's what David was. But also, that's, it's not just emotional temperament. What's another common cause that we find in the scriptures for these feelings that David is confessing about? Well, physical weakness. You, you don't have to read far in the scripture before you bump into one of the greatest of all of God's servants. You remember his name, Elijah. Elijah stood against a nation. Elijah stood against a king and his entire army. Elijah stood against an entire army of false priests of Baal. And he was total, unflinching, unafraid. He even, when he won, do you remember on Mount Carmel and the fire on the altar and who is the Lord, that whole scene in, in 1 Kings 18? Do you remember what he did? He had all 400 of those prophets slaughtered. Uh, he probably was right there making sure the last one was dead. But then he was tired and he was hungry and he runs for his life from one woman, Jezebel. And we find him sitting under a broom tree in the desert saying, God, I don't want to live anymore. I'm ready to die. I have no purpose left to live. And you know what the Lord does? He pats him on the back and smiles at him and says, you need a little rest and you need to eat. And so if you read the scriptures, he rested him and fed him, rested him and fed him, has a private retreat with him, and Elijah's right back there. You see, sometimes his physical weakness and a plunge into disquieting thoughts and emotions can be caused by physical factors. And illness is a good example. Now, when I was little, uh, my parents used to give me the same presents for my birthday and for Christmas. And they'd say, now we want to do something that's significant. And, and so we want to tie these presents together. We don't have many resources. What would you like? And I said, I would like to have the consecutive volumes of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Now back then those were six, seven hundred pages and they were very expensive for my parents. My father worked in the auto industry and was just an hourly employee and so it, it was a significant investment for him to buy one of these. And so I would get one of these volumes and I would read Spurgeon. Let me tell you about Spurgeon, my hero. He was one of the greatest evangelical leaders of the last century but he suffered from constant reoccurring bouts of depression. Why? Why would such a giant, such an incredible expositor, such an incredible writer and pastor have severe bouts of par paralyzing depression? Well, the main reason, as we look back, is he suffered from gout. It was marked by a painful inflammation of all of his joints. He had this excessive amount of uric acid in his blood, and he shared a health condition that many people in his generation shared from the British Empire, from their eating habits and lack of exercise and, and fresh air and everything else from that time period that, that just physically drained him, caused him to have no strength, and because his temperament was prone to depression, it just would start snowballing. And if you know Spurgeon's history, his wife would often have to just just help him into bed when he'd get back from church and he would sleep and stay in bed for sometimes two and three days and then she would uh, in fact in his biography it says that sometimes he would be so troubled that in his sleep he would talk and she would write down what he said and that would later become his outline because he was so discouraged he couldn't have his sermon that he would be dreaming about it and and talking in his sleep but Spurgeon is a great example that we should always, like David, like Elijah, like Charles Haddon Spurgeon, when we're hungry and tired, we should beware of the times of this extreme fatigue and physical weakness making an open door for the devil or our flesh to try and push us down. One last uh, area we can see from the scriptures, emotional temperament is one reason that, that David's mind seemed troubled, his physical weakness was another. But another is let down. Another weak time is often caused by a great event and then the letdown, the emotional crossing over the top and then dropping down to a kind of a lesser time in our life. And those letdowns in our life 
are truly a, a time that we should be careful. And, and one of the greatest examples of this is found in the Gospels. If you read the four Gospels carefully, you find that Jesus Christ always went on some type of a personal spiritual retreat after the big events of his life. Right after the feeding of the 5,000, what does he do? He goes alone and has this extended period of prayer. See, he needed the face of the Father. He wanted to always commune and say, I want to do your will. And it, it not because Jesus was lacking anything, but because he was the example to us that he could not exist apart from that retreating to be strengthened and renewed by his Father. Any less for us? If, there, if there's a pattern in your life, look for letdowns leading to a, a quick roller coaster ride down emotions and then discouragement and then abandonment feelings and learn to, to head that off by a personal retreat to the Word in prayer even an accountability with your partner if you're married or with close friends if you're not married or with both and, and, and ask those around you to hold you accountable when they see you succeeding saying watch out remember that's a that's a, a delicate time that's a time where you better be careful and prepare for that well what's David saying when his mind feels troubled he's saying I can't stop these feelings of dejection I can't stop these feelings of abandonment so he goes now to the end of verse 2 here's the last cry he says how long will my enemies be exalted over me the last thing he's saying is my life seems to have lost your victory God I've lost you making me a victor David is saying it's no use literally in the context he's saying Saul's gonna win Saul has all the resources of the nation. He's got all the troops in the army. He's got all the time he needs. And, and I'm just constantly running, and, and I'm going to fall asleep someday, and, and they're going to find me and do me in. And, and, you know, down deep, do you know what's really happening here? David is saying, but God, didn't you promise me I was going to be king someday? Isn't that what your word says? Isn't that what Samuel came? Your prophet, and he anointed me with, with your oil, and he said, you're going to sit on the throne, and God, my enemy's going to triumph over me, and if it's not the Philistines getting me, Saul's going to get me. I thought your word said. And when David got to that point, he was right where Satan wanted him. Do you remember in the Garden of Eden what Satan did to Eve? Do you remember he wanted her to doubt God's word and doubt God's goodness and doubt God's plan and, and he said has God said that did God really say that and, and he's planting these seeds of doubt and, and David the seeds are full blown now most of us probably don't have literal human enemies like David did at least not as serious of enemies but if you're a Christian don't forget you have one great spiritual enemy who's worse than any human enemy imaginable and of course that's the devil and he's the one that Peter compared to a roaring lion seeking someone to devour how does he devour us his teeth are not uh, white ivory teeth that we see in, in all the, the, the movies of the roaring lion. No, his teeth are sowing the seeds of doubting God's promises, doubting God's faithfulness, doubting God's goodness, doubting God's timing, saying, wait a minute, is God, isn't he paying attention? Look how old I am, and I, I, don't, I don't have a career yet, I don't have a partner yet, I don't have a child yet, I don't have enough savings, and I'm near the end of my working time, and, and what's wrong with your timing? And that's where David was. And David said, it's no use. Saul's going to win. God's promises aren't true. And that's where the devil wants us. Dr. Lloyd-Jones, in this passage, said, The devil is the adversary of our souls. He can use our temperaments and our physical condition. He so deals with us that we allow our temperament to control and govern us instead of our temperament being kept where it should be kept. There is no end to the ways the devil produces spiritual depression. And we must always bear him in mind. Listen, if the devil wants to get you down, he gets you down by letting your emotions run your life. We're supposed to bring every thought into captivity, 2 Corinthians 10 says. 
A command from God. Don't let your emotions. What is supposed to run our lives? Galatians chapter 5. Walk in the what? The Spirit. That's right. Walk in the Spirit. Not according to our flesh, our emotions, our temperament. So that's those four cries we just went through in verses 1 and 2. Are David confessing? He's confessing, Lord, my, my, I'm doubting your promises. My mind is so troubled. Lord, I'm just endlessly in struggles. I don't have your blessing. Now the question is, how did David come out of this? How, how did, did David find the doorway of hope in hopelessness? How did he find God's presence in abandonment? Well, quickly look down at verse 3. Because David decided he was not going to live in the pits. And aren't you glad he wrote it all down for us? In fact, as I'm reading this verse to you, verse 3 of chapter 13 or the 13th Psalm, I wonder if David ever thought that his hard times would be such a blessing to you and me 3,000 years later. I don't think he had any comprehension of that. I, I wonder if he even knew that what he was putting on this scroll later on as, as God inspired him to write this. I wonder if he even knew how long that scroll would last. I'm sure glad it's lasted by God's power to this day. Because David decided he wasn't going to live in the pits, so he looks up and he starts talking to the Lord. The, the Lord, the one he thought had abandoned him, all he had to do is look up. Now, in my own life, I know that there are some times when it just seems like, like dealing with everybody else's problems and dealing with all the problems in the family and all my personal problems and then something like a car or, or, or the house or something breaks. It just seems like you're so overwhelmed, you just don't know where to start. And, and Bonnie will come up and find me sitting at my desk looking down. And she'll say, honey, what's wrong? I'll say, nothing's wrong. But she notices that when I talk to her, I don't do what? Yeah, I don't look up at her. Because I'm looking down at my problems, and, and that's what I'm meditating on. You see, anxiety is, is meditating on your problems. God didn't say meditate on your problems. He says meditate on my word, on the promises I've made for you. So do you know what my wonderful Bonnie does? I look over at her, and I think of that every time. I will be sitting there looking down, seeing nothing, and not knowing where to begin because it's overwhelming, and there's too much, and it'll never get done. And I feel her little hand, and she just puts her hand under my chin and says, Look up at me. Look up at me. And lifts up my chin. And then what I do is I, I keep my eyes down. And she said, No, I want to see your eyes. You know, you ever, you ever done that? Your kids, you say, Look at me, and they, they look down. It's acting like a child, isn't it? And I do that. And she'll say, No, look at my eyes. And when you look, look at verse 3. Because this is David getting the lift in his soul from the Lord and the Lord saying, look at me, look at me. Now we could put these words into David's mouth because the turning point was prayer. Here's how the poet put it. When all things seemed against us to drive us to despair, we know one gate is open. One ear will hear your prayer. Whose ear is that? The one David addresses is to. Verse 3. Let me read it to you. Consider and hear me. Follow along in your Bible. Consider. That's the first word we're going to look at. Hear me is the second word. O Lord my God. And the last word. Enlighten my eyes. Lest I sleep the sleep of death. And he goes through verses 4, 5, and 6. David cries out in this prayer to the Lord for three things. And that's what God wanted to hear from him. Did you catch that? David asked for three things, and that's exactly why the turbulence hit David's life. You remember what I said at the beginning about the 27,000 feet in the airplane and the luggage falling out and everybody screaming? That caused us all to think about what? Yeah, the pilot. When you feel abandoned, when you feel hopeless, when you feel dejected and despair, it is not because God wants you to stew in those feelings. He wants you and me to what? Think about him as the pilot. Say, who's really running my life? It isn't supposed to be me. And that's what David does. And David looks up. And when he looks up, he says, Lord, three things. First, he says, look at me. That's what consider literally means in Hebrew. Look at me. Look at me. 
He asked the Lord to turn around and look at him. See, actually, God was looking at him all the time. It's just like what I said about Bonnie. Bonnie was looking at me the whole time when I was struggling. She had to lift up my chin and say, look at me. And David, he thought it was the Lord who had left him. He had looked away from the Lord. You see, it was his perception of God that led him into this emotional roller coaster, just like us and our wrong perceptions. David says, Lord, look at me. And actually by saying that, he starts looking at the Lord. And the Lord lifted his face, and the Lord looked in his eyes, and David knew that the God he cried to heard him. Secondly, look at verse 3, the second little phrase there, hear me. That, that literally means hear me by an answer. I, I, it's not just, I hope your ears get these words. It's I hope these ears elicit a response. When he says hear me, it, it means hear and answer me. The, the, actually, this word is only translated this way here. Everywhere else, it's, it's not saying hear me, it's answer me. It's actually literally the Hebrew word for answer. And he's saying, Lord, answer me. Talk to me. David's asking the Lord to let him hear his voice, like in the old days. And in our lives, that's when we take God's word and and say, Open your word to my heart again. Let me cling to your truth. It's when we honestly say, Lord, I don't get anything out of that book that you gave me. And I want you, you who wrote this, you who inspired it, you who through your spirit enlightened my eyes, I want you to open your word to me. That's what David says. Answer me. Speak to me. Help my unbelief. But the last thing David prays is at the end of verse 3. And he says, Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. And that's restore me. He said, Look at me, answer me, restore me. Lift up my chin so I can see you. Say something to me. And when you say something to me, It will enlighten me. It will bring light in the darkness of my soul. Now, if you have read the Psalms, this is a reoccurring theme. It's not like one dose, like I get my polio vaccine for life. It's not like my 10-year tetanus shot. David was prone to discouragement. David was prone to dejection. That's what made him so powerful. He was so emotive that that people felt what he felt. But those who who can feel so, so powerfully can feel very dark at times. So he said, enlighten me, fill me with light, restore me. This is when we say to the Lord, you promised to never leave me. So I need your presence again. I want to feel it. You told me you love me to the uttermost, so I need your power again. I need to feel your power in my life. You said that you would comfort me. I need your peace again. I need to feel it. I need to feel your presence. I need to experience your power. I need to just be surrounded by your peace. Now one more thing before we go. I don't want you to miss this. Listen, here's a parting truth to hold on to. To be abandoned means you once were not. Right? You can't say that my wife abandoned me if you never had a wife. You can't say that that my friends abandoned me if you didn't have friends. And when David said his God that he loved, that he knew, that he walked with, had abandoned him, what? That means he once had a God who knew him, loved him, and walked with him. Think of the implications of that. If you, as a true child of God, have a feeling of abandonment, what you're saying is that we feel abandoned because we really know God is there. And to be abandoned, you need someone to be abandoned by, and that's because we as Christians have been taught by God in the Scriptures. We know that God loves us and He'll be faithful to us. And we have to know that regardless of our feelings. Last last thought. As you go, remember this. The devil wants to make you doubt God. His goodness, his plan, his timing, his word. And as soon as doubt takes over, your emotions, your temperaments running the show, piloting your plane, and you are going to nosedive, and you are going to have roller coaster rides, and you are going to have that. And that's when you need to start thinking about who's piloting this thing. 
And you need to look up. And you need to say, Lord, not my temperament, not my emotions, not my doubts, not my feelings. You. You I look at. You I listen to. You. You are the one who can rescue me. Later on today, why don't you read verses 4, 5, and 6. You know how it ends? David is singing to the Lord. Do you know what I see? I see this hunched over man looking and weeping and wailing and crying out, How long? How long? How long? And all of a sudden he stops and he lifts up his chin and he says, Consider me. Answer me. Enlighten me. And all of a sudden in that spiritual moment, God gives him that presence, that power, that awareness. And by the end of Psalm 13, that started with cries of anguished abandon, he's back to singing to the Lord. And I can just see David walking into the cave of Adullam, singing, singing something like, The Lord is my shepherd, or the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He is my rock. He is my refuge. Can you hear him singing? A lot of praise songs are David's words. That's what God offers in our times of feeling abandoned. Don't be ashamed. Don't hide. Don't refuse to share those feelings because if you share them with someone who is truly a godly Christian, they will not say, oh, you shouldn't have those feelings. You know what they will say? Why, you're having the same feelings as one of the greatest saints of all time, David who Jesus Christ is named after because Jesus is called the son of David. And you're having the same feelings that David had. And why don't you let me show you in Psalm 13 and in Psalm 40 and many other places how David learned to no longer feel abandoned. And that's what Christ offers to us today. Let's bow forward a prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for this book that's before us, your book. Thank you that it's real. These are real people in real places that had real problems that are just like ours. And I thank you that David was unashamed to talk and to share the depths of his soul. And thank you, O Lord, that your spirit captured these words through the inspiration of your word and your scriptures. And they give us hope today. And I pray that everybody who reads this uh, 13th Psalm, who hears these words from you, will let you lift their chin, that they will hear your voice and let you enlighten their soul. And I pray that we will go from times of dark thoughts and uncontrolled emotions to walking in the light of your life that you give us, O Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.